Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's BU Alumni Career Webinar, Improvisation, a Key Skill for the 21st Century Leader. My name is Jeff Murphy. I'm a member of the Alumni Career Engagement Team here at Boston University in the Office of Alumni Relations. Today's webinar is offered to our 366,000 alumni around the world and, of course, all of our current students. Throughout your career, BU is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals, and we aim to do this by providing everyone with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. Uh, again, I know we have folks that have joined us from some very far away places. So please know that we really do value your participation in this and every event that we offer. Before I introduce today's speaker, just a couple brief housekeeping notes. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website, which you can find at bu.edu slash alumni. And our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions that you may have. We're definitely gonna save a few minutes at the end to get to those, but you are welcome to submit them throughout the presentation. <laughs> Q&A box, uh, much like you did with the chat. Just click on Q&A, type in your question whenever it comes to you, uh, and we'll make sure to save some time at the end to get to those. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, BU Questrom School of Business alum, Theodore Klein. Theodore is a managing partner at the Boston Strategy Group, or BSG. Uh, he has over 40 years of executive management experience at several premier consulting firms and was the CEO of Boston Systems Group, named one of America's 100 leading consulting <coughs> firms. Ted, I feel like I should be referring to you today as professor, as you were a former BU faculty member. You are also the proud parent of a current BU student, so I'm glad to know that we've got you connected to BU in so many ways. Thanks so much for being here today. I'm really excited for this presentation. Um, Go ahead and uh, if you want to get your slide deck up and running, uh, then the floor is all yours. Thank you, Jeff. I very much appreciate this. I'm going to just get myself going here. Um, have you stopped sharing? I did. Yeah, you should be able to go ahead. Okay. I've just got a uh, few. There we go. Awesome. I know. I know you're working off of one monitor, which is uh, can be complicated uh, with Zoom. So thanks. It looks like you've got it up and running here. There we go. Perfect. Good. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. Sure. Well, thank you everybody for attending. I appreciate you uh, listening to me. As Jeff mentioned, I uh, used to be a professor at Questrom many, many years ago. Gone on, have done 40 years basically in management consulting, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about applied improvisation which is a very relatively new technique, a very new technique that a lot of large corporations are using across the globe to basically help their employees and help all forms of professional staff engage with the organization. I'm assuming everybody can hear me. Um, I grew up in New York City. I have a tendency to talk very, very, very fast. This is a very, very content rich presentation. Uh, we'll try to take some questions at the end. If anyone would like to get in touch with me afterwards, or if anyone would like a copy of this presentation, just drop me an email. It's up there on the screen. I'm always eager to talk about this, and I'm always eager to explain some of the more nuanced and complicated points. We also do a custom presentation of this for many corporations, if anyone might be interested in that. And I've packed down about, oh, I would say about 600 slides into our hopefully what will be an hour presentation. I know Jeff will cut me off at the end of an hour, so I'm going to just try to get through this as quickly as I can and make it as interesting as I possibly can for you. Now, traditionally, a college lecture is often described as when the material flows from the notes of the faculty <clears throat> into the notes of a student without passing through the minds of either. While I'm pretty much engaged with this material, I'm going to try to get you to be engaged with it as well. Uh, hopefully this will not bore you, and I think I've got a lot of material here that you're going to find quite interesting and quite helpful. So what I want to do is basically explain that we're facing a lot of major challenges today in large organizations. We've got things like the Great Resignation. We've got things like quiet quitting. We've got people, new generations of people that are coming into the organization. And organizations are being faced with major challenges as the workforce changes. Large organizations across the globe are now finding 
that by teaching and using improvisational principles and skills, it can be incredibly helpful to basically engage employees, employ, engage staff, as well as to build connections with senior management teams. So what I wanna start off with here today is from a very important 20th century philosopher uh, by the name of Marx. Now, many of you are probably thinking, okay, I'm gonna start this presentation with some quotes from Karl Marx. Well, nothing could be more incorrect. I'm not talking about Karl Marx when I start this presentation. I'm talking about Groucho Marx. And Groucho had a couple of key things he said, and I wanna kind of repeat them here because I think it makes a very good introduction to this particular uh, presentation. I'm gonna put forth some principles here today. And Groucho said, these are my principles. And if you don't like them, well, I have others. Well, improvisation is based on some key principles. And once you understand those principles, and some of you may have a little bit of background in this, you recognize that these improvisational principles are highly applicable to business, to organizations, to management. Secondly, some of this gets a little bit nuisanced. Groucho said a child of five could understand this. Let's go find somebody who has a child of five. But once you begin to get your mind around the basic issue, it all begins to fit together. So it may seem a little bit complicated, a little bit content rich at the beginning, but these ideas have been scientifically proven. There's a lot of work that's going on in the universities right now that are showing that this stuff actually works. And then Marx often started off when he did presentations by before I speak, I have something important to say. So I'm not actually gonna speak today. I'm gonna just tell you something important. And later on, if you wanna hear me speak, I'm more than happy to talk to you further. So that by way of my introduction is by the very esteemed philosopher, Marx, Groucho Marx, that is. So the point of today is to introduce something new to you. Some of you may have some background in this, and I'd welcome a discussion at some point. But this is what's known as a learning and development approach. That's all applied improvisation is. Gaining wide acceptance in business. And I can tell you hundreds of companies in the US that are beginning to do this throughout their organizations. Improvisation, as strange as it may sound, can help you make become a better manager. That has been shown, that has been demonstrated. I wanna to try to tell you a little bit about why that happens. And then lastly, improvisation can help improve six key management competencies. And that's what I wanna to try to describe some of those at the end. So that's my for agenda for today. When we're all done, you can get back in touch with Jeff and say, well, did he hit his objectives or did he not? That's where we're going. Here's our table of contents. This is what I wanna run through. A lot of stuff. I'm gonna introduce what is improvisation at its essence. What are the different types of improvisation? Why is it so beneficial? I wanna talk about some models that we have created at Boston Strategy Group. We are believed to be the first firm in the globe that have come up with an actual model that connects improvisational theory with business and management. It's been on everybody's minds for many, many years but we've actually connected the two piece in what we consider to be a highly effective and what is becoming known as a well-established model. And then lastly, talk a little bit about improvisation and where it can be used in management. That's my objective today, those three key pieces. Let's see how I can do. To start off with, <clears throat> some of you, and um, if you have been involved or you've ever attended an improv show, uh, throw a little note in Jeff, Jeff's chat box. He's connecting here with me as I present. I'd be curious just to know how many of you have some background in improv, and you can let Jeff know. But it predominantly is about uh, centuries-old theater practice. It's been in theater for years. A lot of background in creative movement or dance as well. Some of you may even have heard or participated in jazz improv, music. So improv began in the performing arts. About 30 years ago, it began, people began to say, wait a minute, we can start using this in business as well. And a small group of people about the 1990s, 1995, began looking into this. Because what people began to realize, if you look at improv theater, if you look at improv and dance, if you look at improv and music, it's all about trust. That's the essence of improvisation. I trust the person I'm working with. And what you began to realize in business is that when people in a business trust each other, 
they are more productive. When people are more productive, they have more profitability or business becomes more profitable. Talk to any business executive and you mention the word profits and immediately they go, yes, let's talk about profits. That's what business is about. Now, improv can be applied to nonprofits and lots of other fields, but right now I'm talking about it as it applies to management of profit-making organizations. So that was the initial seed that got people thinking about how can we use improvisational theory in business? It, the essence of it is about how do we build trust and how do we leverage that increased trust? So, you know, the idea is how do we do business more productively? So here this cartoon is saying they're sending all of us to auctioneering class. If we learn to talk faster, we'll get more done at staff meetings. Well, some of you may chuckle because that's the way your organization actually works is we're all looking to do things better. Talking faster is obviously not the answer. There's an old saying in management, which is there are always management solutions to technical problems. There are never technical solutions to management problems. This is not a technical solution like talking faster. This is a way of looking at interactive personnel, looking at how people relate to each other. How do we improve trust so that we can improve productivity so that we can improve profits? That's the essence of my mantra. So to start off with, we'll talk about team communication. Now, about three years ago, Francesca Gino, who's a professor at the Harvard Business School, got involved in improvisational theory. And she wrote a very important article that appeared in the Harvard Business Review, which is basically considered the gold standard of business publications. And she convincingly wrote, and she was writing to CEOs and board members and senior executives, that improvisation was one of the best ways of giving people in an organization to listen to each other, to build trust, to be more productive and be more profitable. If you'd like a copy of this article, I'd be happy to send you a copy. Just pop me an email and I'd let you have it uh, or I can send it to you. But she having observed and studied and began doing a business study of improvisation saw that it was one of the most powerful ways to bring organizations together towards goals. And I'll have a little bit of a video of her coming up later. So let's talk a little bit about improv. Jeff, I'm just curious, how many people in the chat have actually familiar with or been to an improv show? Anybody? Yeah, we've got uh, Dana, who has lots of experience with improv. Pam has uh, attended a lot of shows, but hasn't tried it herself. And then Rita actually has uh, has been taking uh, online classes during the pandemic, including improv for lawyers offered by Drexel University. Uh, and Pam actually uh, is uh, performing in, in New York City. That's great. OK, so I'm talking to people that actually probably know as much, if not more, about this topic than I do. So for those people and for everyone else as well, if you've watched an improv show, you know that it's team-based. You know that there's absolutely no script. There's no plan. No one has any idea what's gonna happen. Lots of unknowns. There's no characters. There's no location, no relationship when you start. These people get up on stage. They've got no props. They've got no scenery. There's no resources. It's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of uncertainty. You have no idea what's gonna happen. People, things are always changing, always pivoting. And you find that if you're watching a good performance, people are appearing highly authentic. That's how improvisation operates, at least in the comedy or in the theatrical view. So going back to you guys in the audience for a moment, if you've ever watched an improv comedy performance, I want you to think about what you watched and what you saw. And I want you to tell me a little bit about the performer's behavior. Throw some of your thoughts in a chat. I want you to know, what did you notice about this? That it was not, it was funny, it was clever, it was lighthearted, it was amusing. I don't want that. I wanna know what else you noticed about the performance. And we'll give you guys all maybe 15, 20, 30 seconds to think. Tell me, what did you notice about this performance? They're coming in, Ronnie says they are creative. Pam says, yes, and. Uh, Lauren, they're feeding off of each other. Uh, I noticed it was fast thinking on their feet. Mark, yes, and to keep things moving. 
Exactly. Always listening to each other, deep listening from Mark. Perfect. Those are absolutely superb answers. If we were in a classroom, I would go A plus to all of you guys. So let me go to give you my observations here. This is what I notice when I watch these guys performing. Whenever I go to an improv comedy show, I see them listening. I see them dealing with ambiguity and uncertainty. I see everybody coming to Trump form of agreement. There's trust between the characters. They're collaborating, they're cooperating, they're communicating. They're playing certain roles. They're adopting certain roles. They're what's called sharing focus. It's going back and forth. Nobody is speaking over anybody else. Nobody is taking charge. Everyone's being very nimble. They're adapting, they're sharing credit. Somebody already said they're creating and they're innovating right there on the stage. They're being very supportive. They're acting as a team. They're acting as a unit. I think the people who've answered the question, others who've seen improv would probably be nodding their heads up and down and say, yep, you're right. I mean, I had the opportunity to thinking this through over several days. I put you guys on the spot over a few minutes, but we probably all would say, yes, this is what I've observed. Now look at these words. How would you like to have that in your organization? Isn't that what your executives want? If you're a business executive, isn't that what you want in your organization? That's your initial connection between improv in the theater and improv in business. There's an anecdotal or an obvious connection in the way they behave and the way we want organizations to behave to optimize or to, be op to get optimal performance. So it's a very good question to say, how might we do that? Is there anything that improvisational comedy can bring us to business? Because the behavior that we see up there is the behavior that we wanna see in our business. So we get to this very critical foundational slide, which is there really are two types of improv. On the left-hand side, there's something known as improv as a product. That's where, that's theatrical improv. That's comedy improv. And we very purposely call it improv because it's designed to entertain, it's designed to amuse, it's designed to make people laugh. We call the people on the stage performers. On the right-hand side is something that is also improv, but it's different. This is improvisation and we purposely call it improvisation and not improv, sometimes called applied improvisation, where we're talking about participants people in an environment or on a team that are trying to use these exact same techniques, but not to entertain, not to get a laugh, not to amuse, but to try to improve their capability in operating in an organization or on a team. There are techniques to improve a management competency, a management capability. And these two circles, well, these two ellipses overlap slightly but they're very, very separate things. We're gonna draw from one to build on the other, but it's very important to say, I talk to a lot of execs who say, we're not here to have fun. We're here to accomplish a business goal. And I say, absolutely, we're not here to have fun. We're here to achieve improvements in your organization, not to have fun. By the way, we're gonna have a hell of a lot of fun doing it, but that's not our objective. And we have to maintain that distinction. We have to maintain that differentiation to be successful. So I wanna basically say, we're not here to have fun today. That's why I've got 125 slides I'm gonna go through with you and show you all these details. It's a very content rich, scientifically proven, effective way of improving organizations. <clears throat> this is an example of performative improv. This is theatrical improv. Not a very good comic, but it illustrates the point. This is an improv night. Everybody's performing, everyone's showing off. That's not what we're trying to do here. <clears throat> I won't read the slide. If you'd like a copy of it, let me know. But applied improvisation has a very clear, specific definition. There are many books that have been written about it. It's nothing more than a training modality. It's nothing more than a method of experiential learning. It draws heavily from education theory, psychological theory, business theory, organizational theory. It started in the theater. 
lots of books that describe the transition from theater to business. It basically has to do with dealing with uncertainty. And those of you who've ever been to a show, you know it's highly uncertain what's gonna happen. Um, business is dealing with uncertainty. Any of you who come out of question or have had a class in business strategy, know you're dealing with uncertainty. And as I just mentioned, improv is really nothing more <clears throat> than experiential learning. It's a way of getting people in a group and helping them learn about themselves and how can they improve their management capability. Science behind it. I, we publish every year a bibliography of all the material that's been published in the improv theory, in the improv uh, environment. If you'd like a copy, I can get you one. This is one recent study done <coughs> a couple of years ago that talks about how improvs promotes divergent thinking, uncertainty tolerance, and makes people more confident. Again, science, lots of background, psych in it, lots of statistics. Not gonna talk about it, but it's there. Uh, I Somebody in the audience is taking a class in law. Improv is being used to train attorneys. If you're in a courtroom, you've got to think fast on your feet. Improv can help you do that. Being applied with hundreds of companies across the United States. Medical improv is an incredibly growing industry, helping doctors, nurses, medical technicians work together. <laughs> in secondary and primary and universities, it's also being used. MIT uses it, Questrom uses it. It's a whole program in improv at Stanford Business School. I mentioned law, and it's also being used at MIT in science to teach science and lots of other things. So it's a very growing, <coughs> excuse me, young, but very growing field. Why? Well, there are eight key reasons why improv is growing. One, Generation Z, Generation X and Y, more and more seeing the comedy, more and more people are seeing that this can be applied in a business situation. Lots of generational dynamics here. Younger people are realizing it as well, accelerating change in the marketplace. Um, there's a diminishment of interpersonal competency in organizations. Joseph Owen, who was the president of Northeastern University, <clears throat> wrote a book a couple of years ago called Robot Proof. And he said that the universities today are teaching data literacy. They're teaching technical literacy, but they're not teaching interpersonal literacy. Our ability to function as a team is diminishing and universities are not focusing that. He's saying that people come into organizations today very analytically competent, but not interpersonally competent. So I work with a lot of executives who go, you know, I just hired 50 new college graduates or 50 new graduate students, they're all very well trained in tech and analytics. They don't know how to work together. That is another reason why this is catching on. And lots of ambiguity in today's world, increasing ambiguity. The need to build awareness of what's going on. Lots of competitive change. And the fact that people are seeing that there are real tangible benefits to using improvisation. So I can talk obviously a great deal more about these benefits, but they have been documented, they've been analyzed. There's been seen a great deal of value, real financial monetary value in using improvisational theory in all forms of organizations. Three major categories of benefits, community, institutional, individual. Improv can not only improve a company or an organization's relationship with its community. I can talk more about this later. Institutional, it can improve the quality of an organization, its marketing capability. It can improve its profits. It can improve its communications within an organization. Improv has been shown at diminishing silos, information silos in businesses. There's a very famous story about Robert Dole, you may remember was a Republican senator. He was hated by the Democrats. This I believe dates to the 1990s. Somebody ran an improvisational class for the Democrats and Republican senators at the Capitol about 20 years ago. 
Robert Dole, who was a hated Republican senator, participated. At the end of the session, Dole and the Democratic seminars were shaking hands, slapping each other on the back, and beginning to recognize each other's points. It reduces conflict in an organization. Not gonna go into the benefit case, be happy to have a subsequent presentation on that, but improv is all can improve individual performance. You learn a little bit about your management skill and where you need improvement. So that was the introduction. Talked a little bit about what is it? Difference between theatrical improv and applied improv. And the fact that it has three major charity, three major categories of benefits. Let's now talk about how it connects with management. How do we actually show that this is a valid, credible, realistic thing for us to achieve? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a model. So I'm gonna skip here now and go back to Francesca professor at the Harvard Business School and talk a little bit about what she said. So let's see if I can get this up and running. A lot of lessons in it. So for example, stop, I've got a gun. <laughs> the I think I've got to share my screen here. Kevin, is that uh, coming up okay? We're back on your slide deck. I think you okay. want to share your desktop. Yep. back on that slide deck. Yeah, I think I'm gonna skip the video for now, Kevin, because I'm having a little bit of trouble getting it up there. Fair. Okay, hang on one second while I go back to my slide deck. I still got you there with me? Yeah, it does look like your uh, file froze there though. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to the presentation. Okay. okay. Yep, we got that now. Good, you got that up there? Yep. Okay, anyway, the YouTube, video there, if people would like to take a look at it, I would strongly recommend it. Okay, so here's what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to connect comedy with business. A lot of you may be a little skeptical and say that's not something we really can do. Let me show you how we actually can do it. I'm gonna start off with a slide that talks about ideals. These are things that we're aspiring to. An ideal is an aspirational statement. And on the right-hand side there in red, you can see, and those of you who've been involved in improv, know that these are ideals that you aspire to. You want to embrace trust. You want to achieve a goal. You want to have a purpose. You want to provide support to the organization or to the people that you're connected with. You want to try to serve a greater whole. And you want to find some playfulness. Now, those are basically improv ideals. That's what you're taught in an improv comedy class, or one of the many things that you're taught. Well, if you think about it, those ideals can also connect with business ideals. Business ideals are there on the left. If you're a business person, if you're a business executive, that's what you're achieving. You're looking for profitability, value, improving people's lives. Well, we wanna to try to connect those business ideals with those improv ideals. And I'm gonna kind of show you how we're gonna to begin to do that. Well, what I did was I created a model. Now, again, probably a lot of your eyes are rolling and going, oh my God, a model. Well, that's what this is. It's a way of connecting the two. And the particular model that I'm using is four levels and it starts off with values and it ends up with ideals at the top. And I'm gonna use this framework to begin to connect things together and to show the connections between business and improv. Well, what I just gave you was somewhat abstract. It was a very abstract model. Uh, this is a cartoon making a little bit of fun at it, moving from the abstract to the detailed. But this is a businessman saying, well, this is a great business model. Can we get a few more details? So let me dive down into this model as best as I possibly can. My model consists of four levels. 
ideals, guidelines, principles, and values. I'm not gonna read through the words. Happy to send you the slide deck if you're curious to actually read the words and begin to understand. But each of these levels of the model have a purpose, and that's what's most important, purpose. Basically to show that the purpose of the ideals between improv and business can be similar, guidelines can be similar, principles can be similar, and the values can be similar. And it's explaining what this model is all about. So I'm gonna start up at the foundational level, which is the values. And some of you who've taken part in improv classes, or I think there are one or two people who have actually performed improv, know that these three values are drummed into your brain at the very beginning of any class you take. It's called active listening, saying yes, and saying and. And they provide the foundation for what's going to connect business improv with theatrical improv. It's what we value in our behavior. Listening, saying yes, saying and. And let me give this, uh, I'll skip through this one here actually, and say this, value of active listening. These are the three things that we learn how to do and we practice them and practice them and practice them. And business people that practice and practice and practice them find that become better managers. One example of value listening, active listening, is that if I were to say to you something like this, yeah, right. The meaning of that is the exact opposite of the words. When you're listening, you're listening not only for words, you're listening for meaning and you're listening for emotion. That's one definition of active listening. So if I say to Kevin, yeah, right. Kevin knows I'm saying no, wrong. Because he's listening not only to the words, he's listening to the meaning, he's listening to the emotion. That's one definition of active listening. When we get better at that, we become better business and managers. Better business people, better managers. The second value is saying yes. Talk a little bit about that in a moment. And saying and. And that just means looking for move, ways of agreeing, looking ways to move the conversation further rather than shutting it down, rather than being disagreeable. Obviously, if you're a brain surgeon, you're not improvising. If you're an airline pilot, you're not improvising. But these techniques improve any team-based activity. So Stephen Colbert has said, and Stephen Colbert, by the way, is a superb improviser who has trained at Second City, saying yes begins things. It's how things grow. It leads to knowledge. As long as you have the strength and the ability to do that. I can tell you from personal experience that I've become a far better executive having now taken about five years of improv classes. These techniques become ingrained in your psychology and in your thinking. So once again, lots and lots of content here that I don't have the time to dive into, but that's there. What is active listening? What is saying yes? What is saying end? Active listening is the act of taking in everything that's going on around us. Saying yes is just not so much agreeing, not so much um, accepting what the other person is saying, but saying, I understand what you're saying. And saying and is saying, okay, how I might want to disagree with some of you, but how can I and how can I put something on top of what you're saying so that we can become connected in some fashion? These are the fundamental values that shape all personal interactions, and they're highly applicable to the business environment. What we can then begin to do, and again, I apologize for the depth here in detail, but for these three values, there's a connection between theatrical or performative improv, if you remember that circle on the left, and the management perspective of it. So active listening from a management point of view, those of you who are in executive positions know it's about a full awareness on a multitude of dimensions. Senior executives are constantly have a very broad view of what's going on. That's kind of how it connects with active listenings. Senior executives are diplomatic. They may disagree strongly with somebody else, but even in a situation of extreme disagreement, you can respect the other person's opinion. Saying end is a goal organization wants to accomplish a goal. 
we don't want to get involved in an argument. Even if we might disagree on some points of what someone else says, we're looking for ways of moving forward. Anybody who's involved in negotiation and law knows that you want to constantly move forward. Going into a litigious or litigation environment is bad for everybody. So one can begin, and that's all I'm trying to do is get you to initially say, oh my God, there are some connections here between theatrical improv and a management review. So we've just made the connection at the foundational level. I've tried to show or demonstrate there's a strong connection between management and improv at the foundational level. Improv, theatrical improv, then teaches us nine principles, nine key principles. And those can get built upon these three key values. And the nine principles are always be aware, look for connections, be present, initiate something always, try to be agreeable, show vulnerability, keep things as simple as possible, always add value, don't say anything unless you can add value, and we need to constantly create and move the storyline forward. Those of you who have taken an improv comedy class should be nodding your head and go, yeah, I remember that. I remember the teacher telling me that. Well, these are the nine key improvisational, theatrical improvisational principles. We've done a bunch of research. We've gone into a lot of the research and we've come up with this. Well, those principles are the second level of the model and you can see them there. We then have a lot level of the model called guidelines. And these guidelines are built on the principles. And I know you can't see that. So I've come up with the following slide, which lays them all out. These are the 22 guidelines of when, if you're actually doing improv, that you're trying to follow. Those of you who've taken an improv class or have somebody who's done improv and talked about it will relate to all of these. All of these 22 principles can be applied to business. Uh, over on the left, number three, if you're an executive, you may get very bad news. You try to remain calm. I can't help but wonder how Elon Musk right now, if he's remaining calm or not, but he certainly should be. Executives have to remain calm under very situations of stress. Going over on the right-hand column, look for patterns. That's another key improv principle. Business, we're always looking for patterns. Where can we extend a product? How can we adopt a marketing strategy? Um, so these are all 22 fundamental principles that you're taught that apply to management. Here they are here, built up a little larger. Happy to send you a copy of this if you're curious at looking at this. But these are the 22 improvisational guidelines when you're performing. And after you practice, they do become second nature. So what we're beginning to build here, and I'm doing this very quickly for you guys, is we've got our values. Our values lead to principles. Our principles build out guidelines. And the guidelines help us achieve ideals, what we aspire to. And these five ideals, finding playfulness, if you can't have fun in what you're doing, it's not worth doing. I've been a management consultant my entire career. It's been challenging, it's been difficult, but it's always been fun. It's always been enjoyable because I'm always learning about a new industry, a new product, a new organization. You have to trust your coworkers. If you can't trust, it's not worth it. Um, you have to achieve a goal. Businesses are not there to have fun. They're there to achieve profitability goals. You have to provide support to your team. You have to serve a greater whole. So what I'm trying to do here is build a model that shows improvisational comedy on one side, improv comedy, and improvisation in business, and showing that the two can connect. There's many, many more slides that serve as a basis for what I've just shared with you. And all of it does is to achieve these five ideals. When I talk to senior executives about this, they look at this and go, yeah, I got to build greater trust. I, my people are burnt out. Got to figure out a way so they enjoy the work more. People have to support each other. We're doing this not just for money, we're doing this also to improve the community. We're doing this for other reasons. We're trying to achieve goals. So the aspirations are also very, very similar. We get to this very final complicated model that basically senior executives often eat up because they say, okay, I now see 
how these values, principles, and guidelines can connect learning improvisation and applying it in a business organization. So this is the summary of everything that I've just shared with you right now. So what I've tried to do in the last 20 minutes is to do a whole day's presentation in 20 minutes and show you how using that model, we can connect comedy with business management. Once we've done that, we can begin thinking a little bit about, okay, how does adopting this model, how does learning about improvisational values, um, principles, and guidelines make us a better business person, a better manager? This can be applied in law, in medicine, in science, in lots of different areas. It can make you a much better person who deals with other people. So we get to the application, and I've only got a few more minutes here, so we'll have time for questions. But wrapping this up, we've talked a little bit about what is it? What's the difference between it and comedy? What are its benefits? What does the model look like? And how do they actually connect at a scientific level, which shows us it really has legitimate application? Well, <clears throat> improv improves management competence. And we've got a guy in the personnel office asking, what's the minimal level of competence around here? The idea is by doing improv, by learning improv theory, not to become a comedian, not to go on and do a performance, but by learning the techniques, learning the values, the principles, and the guidelines can make you a better manager, can make you a better professional staff member, can make you a better executive. Well, there are six major areas. Most of management is all about leadership. Improv, learning how to do improv can make you a better leader, can make you a better listener. It can make you a better uh, communicator. It can make you a better collaborator. It can help you build better teams because you understand at a intuitive and base level how teams work. It can improve your emotional aptitude. You're listening for not only the words, but the meaning and the emotion underneath the words. You're, look, you're listening for the intent. A lot of different areas of emotional aptitude. You're creating on stage or improvisation is all about creation in the moment, on the spot. A lot of people go, I'm not clever enough to do that. I'm not that quick thinking. I'm not that quick witted. Well, the techniques in improv help improve that capability. So these are the six <laughs> basic areas of management that can be improved. A lot of MBA programs across the country are beginning to introduce improvisational theory into their curriculums because of the six areas. We've done work with Clark University's MBA program to talk about how we can improve their MBA student competency in these six areas by teaching improv. We've done work at Bentley University. We're actually talking with BU right now about possibly doing some work with BU. So these are the management competencies. To get a little bit more specific, these are about 50 different topics that can be addressed <coughs> using improv. All of these various topics are topics of interest to any business executive, any business manager, any professional staff member. Improvisational theory can help with any. I can give you a very good personal example. If we look under the, um, um, what was the one I'm looking for? If we look under, um, goodness gracious. If we look under the emotional apt uh, aptitude one, one of the examples that I can give has to do with delivering difficult news. Now, as an executive, we all have to deliver difficult news at various times. I can tell you quite personally from a story about 35, 40 years ago, when I was a very young manager, I had to fire somebody. I had to terminate somebody. I was, did a terrible job of it. I made that um, termination incredibly uncomfortable, both for the person who had to receive the bad news as well as myself. I, I afterwards, to this day, 40 years later, I regret that conversation I had. 
Having done improv, I now have a little bit better understanding of how to deliver bad news. I know how to, I know how to basically be a little bit more empathetic. Um, because of that, in subsequent times when I've had to unfortunately terminate people, it's gone much, much smoother. In some cases, I can honestly say people have actually left feeling okay about themselves, even though I just delivered some terrible news. Any of these things, any of these areas can be improved with improv training, with improv understanding. So I wanna basically say we've got these six major areas, all of these various areas, and this is only a short list. This is the only one, one of the lists. The area that I was actually talking to, I'm sorry, but I was looking for number four here, difficult conversations. In any form of communications, difficult conversations is something that is not taught in school. It's something we learn through experience the hard way, as I did, but it can be taught. Just an example of the very many skills that can be taught using applied improvisation. So what have we done here? Got a few minutes left for conversation, but we've, uh, for questions, what is improv? We talked about the differences. We've created a model to show the connections and we show that it actually can be applied at all levels of management. So that's what we've got. I can finish this up. We've got about 10 minutes here for questions. I've dumped a lot of material on people. I'm sure that was incredibly confusing, very content rich, but be happy to answer questions if there are any. Uh, if you'd like a copy of the presentation, this is our website, lots and lots of material there if you'd like. Drop me an email if you'd like a copy of the presentation, if you'd like to talk further. I'm always happy to talk about this. Anybody in the audience who's had improv uh, background, I'd love to talk to you as well. Yeah, Kevin, this is, thank you this very is much. great. I, you know, I, I think you did drop a lot of content on everybody. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're willing to share uh, the, a copy of the deck with everyone. I also did put your email your own email in the chat if people want to grab it from there. Um, please, folks, the, you know, I, uh, we, Ted talked about some really interesting stuff. So please let us know what your questions are. Ted, I'm, I'm curious. So early on when you were talking about performative improv and you asked the audience to write in with their observations about what was happening, Carrie, Carrie noted, oh, well, they're all extroverts. And that had me thinking kind of the whole way along about the divide for introverts and extroverts in mastering uh, applied improvisation. And, you know, you, you, you sort of pointed out how using some of the guidelines can help somebody improve in an area, but when, when, I'm, and I'm sure this has come up before when people say, oh, you know, it's going to be hard for me uh, to take charge because I'm an introvert. What, what are the things that you feel like introverts need to focus on among the guidelines? What is your response to any of that? A couple of responses, Kevin. First of all, it's a superb question. Definitely introverts will often find beginning improv instruction a little scary, a little bit harder to do, but it is actually the training, or training's not the word, the learning experience is designed more for the introverts than the extroverts. Um, not all, they may find it a little bit more difficult, but with a good instructor, an instructor who's been properly trained. They know not only how to deal with an introverted personality, but to bring that introverted personality out. So I would emphasize the point that I can, although I come across as an extrovert myself personally, I have developed that skill through a bunch of improv training, which has built my confidence in a, um, in a classroom or in a class environment. Ted, before, before we got started, we, you and I were talking about, you know, your favorite improv performers, your comedic improv folks. Um, and, and I think I remember on a podcast somewhere hearing that Will Ferrell is actually sort of a famous introvert. Are there other performers that you're aware of that are, you know, you would never think that they're introverts, but they are. Right. I would strongly recommend people go to a website called Second City in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Many of you may have already heard of it. Second City is the world's foremost training ground for comedians who are doing improv comedians. Will Ferrell is out of there. Tina Fey is out of there. Amy Poehler is out of there. Uh, those are some of the major comedians that are now performing that came out of Second City. Many of them, in fact, 
if you listen to uh, interviews with them, they will say they started out as introverts themselves or consider themselves introverts. One does not need to be an extrovert to be capable of this. Um, Colin Mockery out of Toronto, who's on Whose Line Is It Anyway? Very, very famous, done a lot of work in the social sciences. He was part of a documentary which talked about how improvisational thinking can help address a lot of social ills. Um, Ryan Stiles is another very successful and famous improviser who has a long career in Hollywood, who I think also has called himself a bit of an introvert. introvert. Uh, Wayne Brady, another one from that show who actually does work with a lot of businesses about bringing business executives into using improvisational theory and improvisational principles. So a lot of people there have come out. They've been both introverts. They are applying a lot of this into the business environment, but getting involved into it as well. Uh, Amina's asked a question. I think I know where you're going to land on this, but um, you said management is about leadership. Do you think improv is a must or a plus for a good manager to lead? It's a great question. I won't go so far. L uh, let me answer it this way. Those effective leaders have adopted the principles of improvisation without realizing it. Personally, I came to, I retired from IBM about 10 years ago. I bopped around as a retiree. I taught a few classes at Boston College, did some other stuff. And then on a lock, I took an improv comedy class myself five years ago. I had watched it, but I never made the connection between improv and management. The very first class, I was like, oh my God, this is what I do. I didn't even realize that some of my management theory connected with improv theory. So I was an executive and a leader without ever knowing improv. I inherently, intuitively was doing some of it. The class blew my mind open and made me realize that there was a tremendous connection between the two fields. So directly answer the question, the great one, it's not a must have. Many of us do this naturally, but for those of us who don't do it naturally, it is a must have. Well, Ted, you mentioned that your firm will go to anybody's organization and do a training on this. We do have a question. I, uh, hopefully somebody's gonna take you up on that offer. What is, what's a critical mass for you? How many people need to be in the room for, for an effective training on this? Is it uh, just a, a, you know, a team, the whole management level? <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the classic, and I'll say it somewhat as a joke, classic and management consulting answer is it depends. <laughs> to be more realistic and to answer the question head on, generally you don't, you, uh, the sweet spot is anywhere between eight and 14 people in a group, in a session. In terms of the number of people, it can be handled latitudinally or longitudinally. Some organizations which have difficult trust issues between executives, managers, and staff will put two executives, four managers, and six staff in a group. Other places will take all their um, accounts receivable team and put them in a group. Uh, it really does depend on what is the goal and the objective that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, but the basic is anywhere between eight and 14 people. And you run, run a session for about two hours. I wrote an article on what does an actual improv session look like in an organization, be happy to send it if someone wanted to pop me an email, identify me that themselves and I can send them exactly how it works. Ted, this is fantastic. I've been looking forward to this for a long time and, and you're, you're um, I can tell that you've been doing this work for a very long time because it just all comes so naturally out of you. Uh, but I, you did a great job today and you. you've done a tremendous service to our community here at BU. So thank you so much for, for sharing this. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate the opportunity. You bet. Uh, I want to thank all of you for, for tuning in today. I want to thank those of you who've donated to the university. We, we definitely appreciate your support. Um, and I want to make sure that everybody, if you haven't already, if you've joined BU Connects, that's our official online networking platform for the university where um, it might be quite possible for you to find other folks around the university who are involved with improv or management, those kinds of things. So definitely make sure you check that out. Uh, our webinar series is actually going to be on a little bit of a vacation during the month of December. December, but we're going to be coming back strong in 
January 2023. So please, uh, in the meantime, make sure you take a look at other events that might be coming up in, in online or in cities near you on the Alumni and Friends website, uh, bu.edu slash alumni slash events. Thanks again, Ted. This was fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Take care, everybody, wherever you are. Have a great day or a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.